So, like, I'm going to use the word coaching and you're going to use the word coaching and we might mean different things. So I think it's important that I explain this. And another, like, we're going to touch on co-coaching and I think it's pretty relevant uh, as co-coaches to because often we're having some some arguments about stuff and it's because we don't believe coaching is the same thing. So um, feel free if you have any questions. So um, I think a job of coaches is to set problems. So Danny Newcomb, uh, I would definitely Google Danny. He talks about our players are as good as the problems we set them. So let's look at, uh, I don't know if people watched the Bristol Saracens game at the weekend, but... Bristol don't set the right problems in training to beat a Saracens team, pure and simple. So they lose to Saracens second team. Um, I think um, like, I think coaching's like long-term. So this is a message of probably that I taught for two years. This was the hardest girl I taught. Often people tell me, Oh, we need to get ready for the weekend. And I'm thinking you've got these kids for five, six, seven years. What's the rush? Um, <clears throat> Noticing skills, the most important skills for coaches, and then developing scanning skills are the most important skills in players. So we'll definitely chat about how you can develop your scanning skills on and off the ball. Um, maybe consider as a coach how often you're looking at where players are looking. And as an example, I do not think that defence coaches should be stood behind defences. I think it's the least optimal position to stand. But, of course, it's tradition, um, and, of course, most defence coaches do that. Um, I do a bit of work with Ulster, and um, I don't think Jared Payne stands behind us as much as others do. Um, I think you've got to understand how people can be at their best and what makes them wobble. Um, we are a product of our experiences, so <clears throat> I played professional sport. Um, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it as much as my time at uni or youth rugby. Um, and so I'm probably rebelling a little bit. Um, <clears throat> what I think rugby gives us is a family. Um, I, did, I did a session yesterday and I was chatting to a female coach who coaches the girls at uh, Shelford and she spoke about why she got into rugby and it was because her daughter was self-harming and then I met her daughter and rugby saved her daughter's life and like I can live without the tech tech. Like that is what the purpose of rugby and sport is for me. So it's about belonging. It's about connection. Um, <clears throat> and like, I haven't stopped thinking about it since I spoke to her and since I met her daughter, like it's like, it's hit me pretty hard. Um, and, and probably tied in a bit with the stuff at the start. Like we need to understand that people are at different bus stops. <clears throat> so again, often we'll deliver a session to the masses and we're, we're missing out on the individual stuff. And that would be the stuff that I'd probably get most excited about. Where are people? So it might be like it's Marcus Smith. So I think back to Marcus Smith at 17. Um, Marcus is like, he's unbelievable at knowing when and why to pass. He's probably the best I know. But he's also at 17, unable to self-regulate. So his competitiveness overused becomes a take care. So we have to work with him on how he can be in the moment. And of course, what makes him wobble is different to what makes other people wobble. So maybe consider what made you wobble as a player and what solutions you came up with. I, that would be something I'm quite excited about is helping players with that. Um, <clears throat> I think our job is to, is to get them to open the front door to us. Often we're breaking in around the back. So like a, a real simple thing for me, I will always ask permission. So I will always ask permission to give feedback. Um, I will always ask permission. So yesterday I coached and I asked a, a kid twice, would you like a challenge? He said no both times. So I didn't give him a challenge. I asked another kid, he said no. And then five minutes later he came and asked me, the door was open. Uh, often I see us like trying to break in around the back and it's quite futile. Um, I would always ask permission around feedback. Are, are you curious as to what I've noticed? Um, would you like me to share something with you that I think would be helpful? If they say no, I'm not sharing it, pure and simple. Um, I, I was at an England session with Johnny Wilkinson. He said, Rusty, I think I'm starting to understand the mental side of the game. I think I'm about 1.3% of the way there, which was fairly distressing for me because he knows way more than me. And 
So that means I've got a long way to go, as I guess we all have. But it's it's intertwined with everything. So everything we talk about tonight will will involve like confidence or the ability to self-regulate or that feeling of belonging. Because if people don't belong, then we won't get the best out of them. So like the caveat with all of this is like, although the psychology stuff is is challenging, it is everywhere. Um, And then the last thing, this is uh, Kailisha Township in um, South Africa that I go to every year. And it really keeps me grounded. Like there's people there who don't have any family members, but actually the smiles on their faces and the joy of sport. Um, like I think that's the purpose. So, so when I say coaching, I'm talking about this stuff. And actually, probably top right, Matt Turner is a good one. I think my job is to work out how to coach people. And like it's really easy to say, oh, that player's not coachable or um that player doesn't take responsibility or and I, can't, I think it probably absolves us of some stuff, but like it took me the longest time ever to coach Matt and it's, I've learned lots from it, but I think that's, uh, we probably learn more from the players that we struggle with. Well, I definitely have and It's the stuff that kind of gets me most excited. So just a brief kind of summary of what I think coaching is. I don't know if anyone's got any questions or, oh, Louise has put some stuff in there. Awesome. Louise, do you want to do you want to chat about what you put in the chat box? Rusty, just a, a question there on the the permission piece. Um, yeah. So I suppose either yourself or when you've worked yeah. with coaches, have you found like if you're trying if they're trying to develop that, they have to hold themselves back because coaches probably see something and their their first instinct is I got to go in and tell them that I got to go in and say it and and I suppose the other the other piece of that then if you've worked with a group for a while or certain players for a while do you feel it goes full circle that they're coming to you you know for the feedback you know they're nearly leading that yeah it's a great question and again so if I just show you this so I've got a few random slides but let's go to this one so this is Ulster Rugby so we've been doing a bit of stuff with their They put these whiteboards together. I would use a whiteboard loads. Um, It helps people who aren't like me. So it helps people who like need to know what's coming next. So, you know, my wife works in special educational needs, like that kind of safe space where they know what's coming next. It's also a great way to then go, right, two players from each team come here. I'm going to explain the rules. You know, you can then go and explain them to to the rest of the team. It also allows a place for players to write stuff. Unmute my audio. Um, allows players to, to write stuff. Now. It's just me. It's fascinating. It's like everyone's first time at Zoom. Um, it allows players to write stuff down that they might not say. So go on the whiteboard, write down the best, you know, the best moment you saw from someone else. But here they've used it really well. So they've got the coaches' pictures and the players' pictures. And then the players are connected with each other and with the coaches. So they work out which coach they're going to interact with, what they're working on. And that for me is like optimal, isn't it? That the the players are coming to the coaches with stuff. So I did a session last week, 32 kids, put your hand up if you came here with something to work on. Two out of 32, because I think their expectation is the coaches are going to do that. And I think that's like strange, but of course, those two kids I can help more than anyone else because they say, Rusty, I'm working on this and I'm working on this. But of course, like, of course, my um, my gift as a coach is to go, actually, it might be something else. Are you curious? I might have noticed something else that could be helpful for you. So, um, yeah, I think, like, it should really be players coming to coaches. I think, again, and you'll know, Eamon, like, I, I wouldn't call that many huddles. I think my job is to... So the Amy Price stuff around video game design is about them creating pauses or timeouts. So you might play a game and go, both teams, you've got two timeouts to problem solve. Um, And you could vary the time or or how they do it. And you could send over a spy from one group to another. But it's just helpful to know when they problem solve. Um, And the other thing I've been playing around a lot with, and it's been really helpful for off the ball as an example. So coach the other week, and I just said, like, I'm here as a resource. If anyone feels like they would want to jump out of the session for a minute, 
while the session's going on, chat to me, and, and we'll notice some stuff, then you can go back in and help your team. Then, so, and, and actually I was surprised, like loads of kids wanted to do it um, because it allows them to think slow. So when the game's going on, they can't like see what we can see as coaches. And they and also partly because they haven't played the game for as long as us. So they might not see some of the stuff that we can see. So that ability to step out, think slow, go back into the game. But again, like if you want to do it, come and come and see me. Um, and I will share the Amy Price stuff, um, Eamon, because I think it's I think it'll be normal in five years' time. So there's stuff around video game design and the principles from that. I think it'll be like really good learning principles. It'll be it'll be normal in 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 five years' time. So I do work with New Zealand Sevens. They've been doing it. Do stuff with uh, Kenny Lynn at Leon in the top fourteen. They are loving it. Uh, I think it's a really good way of doing skill development as well. So maybe on the Tuesday night, if you remind me, Eamon, we'll make sure we put some into it as well. Hopefully I've answered your question. Yeah. Would you, uh, you've answered a question, you've, you've brought me to another one. <laughs> Go on. uh, would you <clears throat> briefly, I know you'll, you'll be going through it in person, but briefly give an idea of what game design looks like on a, on a training pitch? Uh, well, mate, it's like you like predicted my next slide, really, wasn't it? So, if I like, sorry, so so we have up. So the way I think about coaching is, and I'll we have practice design. Sorry, which I'm going to show in a second. We have our behaviours. So what are we doing as coaches? We then have co-coaching, and I'm going to show you some videos Coffee. of co-coaching. Um, and we then have like individual interactions with players. So I think it's a house of cards. So if I go all the way back, sorry, everyone, to, and I will send you these slides. Um, if we get this wrong, and we've all got this wrong, like we get it wrong regularly, it's either too hard for them or it's too easy or it's just really boring, like then the rest of it is problematic. So if I create something that they're just not engaged in or I've lost them, then then the reality is like, I'm just doing behavior management at that point because I've messed up. So, so this is the first kind of option available to us as coaches. And that's what I asked about. Do you plan for action or interaction? Clearly you've got a plan for action. So, and there's pros and cons to different stuff here. So let's, let's talk particularly about off the ball. So if we were to play small sided game, we would get to practice off the ball but only within a certain distance. We don't get to practice this stuff off the ball. We probably don't get the big tactical kicking game that exists in the, in the professional game at the moment. So we, we rub out parts of the game. So I guess as a coach, you've got to think like, what am I rubbing out? And then of course, at some other point in the week, you might have to put that in. Now the flip side is we could do the game, but of course, like some people might, they might get less touches. Um, and, and, and might just like eventually fall out of love with the game. And especially if the conditions are poor, they might not touch the ball that often. And now all of these, of course, these practice designs are linked to, to coaching behaviours. So as an example, um, what do I notice? So I notice that when coaches do this, they end up doing loads of hustle and lots of generic feedback. Great, well done, great, unlucky, da 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 I notice with this that coaches need to be more mindful of where they stand because there's lots and lots of places you can stand and lots of things you can see, and I'll show you a video in a second to demonstrate that. Of course, you can do block practice, um, but you've got to be mindful that like it's got to transfer. So I know loads of people that can stand still and pass, but they can't do it in a game. And of course, the reality is like there's levels, isn't there? And so that's where the video game design comes in. So there's levels of passing. There's probably standing still. There's probably jogging. There's probably running. There's putting a defender in. There's putting multiple defenders in. There's all this stuff. And often we switch, we take them back to the lowest form of it. So we, we make it too easy for them. So in my humble opinion, Sorry, Eamon, apologies to anyone, but I think passing unopposed is almost a waste of time. 
because you don't understand depth. You don't understand when to pass or why to pass. So, and I'll show a video in a second of how I would coach passing. Um, so we have these options as coaches. Um, I'm spending a lot of time up here. And if I could summarize, I'll send a document and some stuff with this on. If I could summarize tactical warfare, um, my, my view on it, and of course, I can have different opinions to me. Other opinions are available. I don't think it's optimal to tell everyone the same information anymore. I used to, because it made me feel happy as a coach. But the reality of a game is you're trying to work out the opposition's on information and deal with it. So if you tell both teams the same stuff, then, then you're not replicating the game. So people might say, oh, I'm doing tactical training, but if everyone has the same information, you're not. So you might tell one team, actually, it's three points if you kick to score and then see how the other team adapts. That's a completely problem, different problem to telling one, to telling both teams it's three points kick to score. And if I give a, an example of, of how I've used that in hockey, so two teams, one team, do you fancy a challenge? Okay, your goal is to get the, the ball back in the opposition half 20 times. And what I also want you to do is tell me who their best player is and your goal is to prevent them touching the ball five times. So now we've got a tactical game. This team do not know what this team's doing. So they get the ball back in the opposition half 18 times. The, um, the best player touches the ball once and then allow the other team to have a huddle to problem solve. So they call a timeout and they problem solve. But the other team listens into their huddle to then see how good they are at working out what's going on. So the best player doesn't speak. It then one of the players who's watching the huddle asks the best player, do you know how many times you've touched the ball? He says, I haven't touched it much. And, and they ask him, do you know why? And he doesn't even know he's been man-marked. They have no idea that they're trying to get the ball back in the other team's half. So, of course, like... We've got to scaffold problem solving a little bit. So we that's why we put timeouts in and we might nudge them as a coach. We might pull a player out and go, look, have you, have you noticed anything about their defence? Or have you noticed how they're marking um, little Johnny? So, so hopefully I've answered your question, Eamon. All of this stuff is available to us. Maybe it's worth considering, like, which are, the, which are your top three and why? Because the other thing about coaching is it's choices. So you need to be able to go, I do this because of this. Now, what I've experienced, so whenever I've done this with, with rugby coaches, um, very few forwards coaches do small-sided games. So the backs do loads of this. The forwards don't do much of this. They don't put their line outs and scrums in the small-sided games, which I would definitely do because I was one of those players that got to stand at the back of a line out and, and become less skillful while the backs were practicing. And I just every so often got to lift someone. Has that answered your question, Eamon? Yeah, no, that's, I'm, I'm loving it. Loving it. Just on that kind of challenges and problem solving, um, what, what age or what's the lowest age you've seen players really be able to grasp that and, and grow from it? I mean, the longer you wait, the harder it becomes, is my view. Um, we will talk about co-coaching, and I'll give you a live example. So I did a football session in uh, Boston, and uh, and it was the under-10s, and we were in this awesome, this big room with a carpet, and we put up some football goals, and we had about 100 coaches watching. And, and I took some co-coaching cards, because we'll get talking about co-coaching in a second. And again, maybe consider how intentional you are around co-coaching. So what percentage of your planning time is about how are we going to work together as coaches? And um, so I had these four co-coaching cards and I offered them to the coaches and said, who wants to come and co-coach with me? Because also my view of coach development is it probably shouldn't be me watching someone or them watching me. It should be as kind of being on the pitch together, hanging out. And uh, one of the kids who's nine said, Rusty, can I be a co-coach? And I was like, oh, wow, hey, like just broken my thinking there. And I said, yeah, of course you can. However, on one condition, um, you... Um, you can't tell everyone what it is. So he got head of happiness. His job was to catch people doing stuff well, fist bump them, and then stretch them. So I, my preference is catch someone doing something well, then move them from that point, as opposed to like 
you know, you're not doing this very well. Like, do you want to try something even harder? Um, and um, anyway, so we do the session for about 20 minutes and this little kid, and I just said, look, if you need to check in with me, if you need any support, give me a shout. And anyway, at the end of the session, like, I think I've smashed it. I'm like thinking this is a cool session. And I said, oh, like, point to the person who had the best interaction with you in the last 20 minutes. And they're all pointing at this pesky little kid. So like, and the, and the reality is like, peer to peer is critical. So anyone that's a parent would know, like my 16 year old son fans finds that embarrassing and all his mates, he thinks are really cool. And I think some of them are dweebs, but you know, such is life. Um, but the impact that kid can have on his peers is really, really significant. And so I guess one of the strong coaching tools is peer to peer. It's really helpful when the best players in your squad are good kids. So like if you've got Marcus Smith or Tom Curry or people, then they're awesome. Like Marcus, which three players do you think you could support today? Do you need my hand? And of course that's, let's go back to who we give information to. I'm not telling everyone. I'm not going, look, you three are rubbish. Marcus is going to help you get better. Like it's a completely different scenario. Like, and again, did it the other day with a 10 year old. Like he's really doing well in this game. I, it was a mixed boys and girls team, actually. And he said, and I was coaching football and I said, oh, mate, come on, do you fancy a challenge? And he said, yeah. I said, look, I, I think you're doing really well. Do you think there's any players in your team you could help? And he said, oh, yeah, the, the two girls be awesome. Like, do you, need, do you need a hand from me with it? Or no, 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 Rusty, I've got this. I'm cool. And off he goes and passes the ball to them. He, when they do stuff well, he, like, congratulates them. And, and he's the best player. So, like, they suddenly start to feel belonging there definitely getting some affirmation and stuff going well. He's helping them as opposed to being unhelpful, you know, when the, the skillful players are either not passing or they're in rugby running out. I mean, the big kids are running over everyone. Uh, they're like your worst nightmare, quite frankly. They're making everyone else like less confident about tackling and they are practicing a skill that in the future is not going to help them unless they are like, I don't know, like the, the, um, the proper place for Australia at the moment. So, and, and if I just give you an example of this, so Eamon, look, here's a small sided game. I would play a lot. And of course, like you can, you can vary this. So if you look at this practice, it's, well, it, it'll explain itself. You have to make two passes before you can score. So people have to work off the ball. Again, think about as a coach, like, a, you know, Watch off the ball here for as long as you can. Obviously, you'll be drawn into the ball at some point. The number of defenders varies. So it's sometimes three, it's sometimes four. For me, this is a passing practice. Coaches can chat to players here and give, you know, and we can vary this. If we wanted them to be wider passes, we make it wider. If we wanted there to be less uh, ability to get depth, we would make it less deep. If we want, if it was going to be contact, I would make it less deep so people have less run-ups. There's loads of stuff. And the other context is I could I could coach the defense harder in this if I wanted, but we just arrived in South Africa and we want to get the ball moving. So so maybe what have a look at. So stuff to think about is yeah. players off the ball, uh, and then also like the different types of passes. Because the other reality is lots of us are coaching one way of passing. And there are lots of ways of passing. So, like, there's a through the legs. Um, got to make two passes, so people have got to work off the ball. They've got to get back into a passing position. There's a, there's a one-handed basketball pass. Like, and all too often, we are, and, if, and, and let's tie this into, like, to, to rugby and tactics and off the ball. Um, you need to be able to pass the ball in multiple ways. You can only tactically do stuff that you can technically do. So this ability to pass and know when to pass is critical. We need to put forwards into practices like this regularly because they are often the limiting factor. Um, and again, just people off the ball, what are they doing? So Jimmy Grayson scores, people have to get deep. People have to move off the ball. Uh, they have to be alert. That's, Jacob and Marga, so if you look at what he does there, like his movement, so just over here, don't look at the ball, don't be tempted by it, doesn't get the ball, has to get back in to become an option. 
Again, what's Ali Crosdale doing? He's actually got to get back into the game. What are people over here doing? If you want to watch good off the ball, watch Fiji play sevens. They are the best off the ball team in the world rugby, in my opinion. Now, of course, we could we could not do this and we could tell people where to stand. Um, the reality is uh, that's why we have to tell forwards where to stand at later ages. And the other thing that's happening here is lots of people that are wingers are in the middle. So Benny Loder was in the middle with goggles on because he needs to practice being in the middle. What are people doing off the ball? Uh, that's what I'm interested in. What did, again, I would probably challenge Jacob, like something I would look at a lot is like, what do you do after you pass? So Jacob, after he passes here, like this is a big moment for what he does. And actually it takes him too long to react. So again, like if we were to look at this practice, it's we've rubbed out like the big part of the game. We haven't looked at people really far off the ball. It's not got kicking, but we can incentivize kick to score. I love this practice and there's so many different variations. I played um, played a, a game the other day where they were, the, the attack had to score four tries. Every touch was a life and they chose how many lives they reckon they could do it within. But on top of that, if the defence got an interception, they won the game. And then we got to the stage where the best player, so let's say it was Jacob here, if you got a touch on the best player, you also won the game. And again, that's a perfectly reasonable pass through the legs, one-handed. Um, there are loads of different ways of passing. We are spending way too much time practicing one type of passing. So, um, in my opinion, definitely, Eamon, feel free to raise a hand. I would love anyone to have a question about this practice or any other practices. And I could just watch this all day. I just thought, this is the stuff that, like, kids should be playing this type of game all the time. Loads of touches. Loads of different, you know, different defences coming from different positions. We can then start to have different start points. Ten points if you make a defender fall over. Like, let's let's get really playful. The kids will come up with loads of really good scoring systems for this. That's actually really typical of Fiji Joe there. So that's Joe Cock and the Singer. Um, this is something I would look for a lot and Joe does it like he's already made a decision which way he's passing. So he's not, he actually hasn't got the option to pass to his right, which might be the best option. So there we go. It does, uh, hopefully that's kind of given you a bit of a flavour of, and I would have, sorry, Eamon, I would have um, a small number of games I would play. I've got a kicking game I play lots that I think is a class kicking game. I've got the rondo and I'll vary it. And then I've got these games. And the benefit of this is that I, I don't need to spend ages explaining the rules. Like, we're going to play the Fiji game. Do you want to start on level three or level four? Or if I want to give choice, do you want to play Barbarians or do you want to play Saracens? My preference would be to give choice, but I might not, like, go, what time do you want to go to bed? I might go, what, do you want to go to bed an hour and half an hour? So I might limit choice but I will generally try and have choice. Um, Charlie, should you show different types of styles of passes for younger age groups beforehand? Um, do you want to, um, Charlie, do you want to unmute and kind of just explain that to me? Sorry. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I was just, just the way you were saying, you know, like the basketball type pass, just when, let's say if you are, you're coaching a certain way where it's, uh, you know, just a standard pass across the chest and then all of a sudden, <clears throat> you introduce that type of game uh, would it might be ingrained in players at that stage that uh, you know there's only one way to pass and they mightn't be you know mightn't have the imagination anymore you might have kind of coached out of them to you know try different types of passes over a player's head and so on if you get me yeah no look and, and, and look I'll go back to it your players will be as good as the problems you set them yeah you set them unopposed passing problems, they'll be they'll be awesome at unopposed passing. Um, and I guess, like, how would I coach passing? I would coach it like that. Um, it's interesting. So Ed Copeland went to Munster and said, oh, you give them all this technical information around pointing their hands towards the target, and da, da 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 Does it transfer to the game? And they said, we've never checked. And, of course, it doesn't transfer. 
So people will say to me, oh, Ben Ryan said he did this. And I worked for six years with Ben Ryan. And I just rewatched the, uh, the Olympic final. And, and fair play, if you can show me loads of passes where players point their hands towards the target, they don't. So, again, the way I probably think about it, Charlie, is this. You would be pretty upset if someone taught your kid just the five times table. So I think we're just teaching the five times table often. And then when it doesn't work or they don't know when to pass, go as a go a player. Like, oh, like maybe if we just had a look at like the problems you've been setting in training. So rondos for me would be like my go-to. And we can vary numbers. So if they're younger kids, we might have less defenders because actually it's a bit more of a challenge. And as I said, if you want to practice wider passes, you make it wider. The reality of the modern game is like, forwards sometimes don't need to make so many wide passes. But I guess at the ages we're talking about as well, we don't know if they're going to end up as a forward. So, you know, Ellis Genge, number eight at 18, uh, Tom, uh, uh, Tom Young's uh, centre at 20, uh, Dan Cole. Even Dan Cole was a back rower at 18. Like, we, I don't think we're, like, helping anyone if we don't teach them all the times tables. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, and maybe like, and, and actually I probably should have shown this before. I'm like, this is how I think the game could be played. So this is like, I was playing against like SA schools and it's going to be messy. Like the other thing I would say is like, if you want to have creative stuff, then you've got to, you've got to live with the mess. Like, and you've got to be comfortable with like, how much mess am I happy with? Um, and I think players here like uh like I would maybe look at some of this and what are people doing off the ball and um, as support players, really, like um, like Tom isn't going to pass that. But, but that Tommy Willis moves to position. Like I think it's a game of evasion. Like we want to keep the ball alive. The last thing we want is a ruck. Like that for me is a failure. Even if we do, I mean, low numbers should be sidestepping. We should be lifting the ball or giving it to the nine so they don't end up with a bad back. Um, we should be able to do one-man clears like that. Everyone should be an option. So way too often it just goes out the back. Um, so this is kind of my view on how the game could be played at these ages. Like, I think we should be taking quick taps. Again, like Newcastle Falcons kicked a went for a losing bonus point and there's no relegation for God's sake. Like, uh, and the ball's going to go down. And I mean, that's a back rower. That's a prop. Like this is the, uh, and the, and the biggest differentiator. So if you would, uh, if you wanted to win loads of games of rugby, like you would make your people with low numbers, really skillful. And you would make people off the ball, really skillful. Um, that would, for me, would be the biggest differentiator you can do at the moment. It's like a big accelerator. And we, we all see the All Blacks and how they're able to play the game. And they've got skillful low numbers, haven't they? Just on the, the, the couple of questions there on, on passing and that as well in the, in the chat. And I suppose to try and summarise some of them, like obviously the, the game in, in the training exercise looks very free-flowing, very laissez-faire. But are there mm. any parameters you'd have on the expectations of the player. Like, would you look at, you said you don't go into the detail of hands falling through and different things, but would it be the intent of the pass or the percentage that the player saw as, as um, are the risk factor the player saw to the pass? Would you, would you have those parameters for them? Yeah, well, look, let me, I actually think everyone's coaching it wrong. So I would do a rondo. I would tell the players to go look we're going to do rondo for 10 minutes um i want you to tell me like where you notice it in your body when you're making nine or ten out of ten passes and that's what i do so and they come back to me and they tell me different things it's when i like twist my shoulder around it's when i flick the ball from my wrist it's when i point this finger it's different for every single player and the probably the thing that hit home with me so marcus smith when he transitioned into the first team at 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 Harlequins, the coaches said he can't pass. Well, it's just completely untrue. But he couldn't pass as they wanted him to pass. So he actually turned around to them and said, look, you, you have two options. 
I can I can run quickly and not put my hands towards the target, or I can run slowly and put my hands towards the target. You have a choice. It's like, which one do you want? So I think we are, like, show me the evidence where it transfers to the game and it's, like, leading to really consistent passing. It'll be different for each person. Just try that as a, you know, again, you could do the same with defence, like, when you get into really good tackle positions, tell me in your body where it is or what's the one thing that helps you. And you'll get individual stuff that you can then help players with. And to be honest, uh, there's a guy called RJ, Richard Smith, used to be academy coach of the Crusaders. And he came over and spent some time with us. And I watched him coaching the scrum halves, and that's exactly what he did. And like, it was like game changing for me. Like we are giving them way too much info. So I was at a hockey session the other day and, I watch this kid and he's trying to do an aerial, it's like a flick, and he's getting so much info from coaches. I actually see him like really struggling to think. And uh, I just said, oh, why don't you go over to the like the net and just practice your, your aerials and come back and tell me like what's the one thing that helps you do really good aerials? And he just came back and watched him practice for about 10 minutes, like really intentionally, same way as you would in a rondo. Just pay attention to one thing, like because you can only pay attention to one thing at a time. And he came back, he said, Rusty, it's when I dip my hips. I need to remember to dip my hips. And like all that info that's just like white noise. And as Doug Lemoff would say, and I'm sure people have read Coach's Guide to Teaching, I think it's a brilliant book. We, we can sometimes like chase five rabbits and catch none. And like often as coaches, we're chasing five rabbits and catching none. Um, hopefully I've answered the question. Um, I'm mindful of time, so I was going to go. So, so the next, um, so the next thing we have is like our behaviours. So, and this will lead into some of the off the ball stuff. So, where we stand, what we look at, what are we doing during the silence? What's our feedback? How do we know it's having impact? So, again, I whenever I go to a club, so I was at Sale the other week, I'll ask the coaches, "What was your your?" most impactful moment with a player and how do you know? I'd then go and ask about 10 players, what was your most impactful moment with the coach today? Interestingly, what they tend to say is, coach or player, Rusty, because they are getting coached by each other, like especially at sales. So Tommy Taylor was unbelievable at coaching other players in his position, which again, if the best kids are like good kids, it's helpful, isn't it? So maybe consider like how aware you are of this. And if I give you a live example, so uh, last time I was with England, I just wrote down stuff I heard the coaches saying. Uh, I created about 30 cards and then we played a game. I always want to make stuff playful, where they have to try and get from one side of the room to the other, a bit like blockbusters. And they have to pick up a card and work out who said it, when they said it, what was the impact and how could they make that phrase better? So as an example, at the start of the session, Eddie said, let's go out and have fun. So this was before the US game and it's young players and he wants to relax them. And, and to be fair, Eddie's the only coach who knows what he was saying and what other people are saying. So you would be blissfully unaware of loads of this stuff. Um, if I don't know how many people mic themselves or video themselves and Sure they are. It's the best thing you can do. It's heartbreaking watching it. Um, but you'll be saying things like unlucky or good, stuff that you're just not even that aware of and come from a really good place but might not be as impactful as you hoped. Um, so we control our kind of behaviours and stuff, and I'll tie this into co-coaching in a second. And maybe just consider, like, how much of each of these you're currently doing. And this comes from... If anyone's interested in like the academic stuff, this comes from Chris Cushion's stuff around like coaching behaviors. Um, and this was interesting. So this was explaining the rules and this was, this led to this. So this was Jimmy Ponton, England under twenties, Newcastle Falcons under 18s coach, mapped out over a season by a guy called Ed Hall. And this was like almost a fifth and actually, just by doing this, just create more time for, for some stuff that might be better. Um, Eamon, which, I mean, or, or anyone really, but which, Eamon, which ones are you thinking you do more of or you do less of that's on here?
Oh, would I personally do more of a lesson? Yeah, more humour. <laughs> I'm not that humorous. People know me. That <laughs> <though>. <laughs> um, probably corrective feedback. I've been guilty of always picking the mistakes more so than the positives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, and of course, as long as you're aware of it, like it's helpful, isn't it? It's like you can then maybe think about like what is the impact. Um, and of course, I would want them to correct it. That's like my my view on it. But uh, or to correct each other. So, and then the last thing is co-coaching. So this is like an England session, 2015. Coaches have just come together. So I'll play it a little bit, and then I'll kind of. I mean, if anyone like wants to unmute or talk about what they're seeing, I'm I'm happy for them too. Um, so. If no one wants to, then I'm happy to talk about what's going on here. So this is obviously some drone footage of some England training, and and I'm I'm really interested in like what people notice about the coaches. <clears throat> They're all on one side. Yeah. So again, we cannot see where any of these players are looking, and if we agree and. Of course, you can disagree with me. All decision-making comes after scanning. So you have to see something to do it. So no one at this moment in time can see where any of these defenders are looking. And I would argue, and this is really typical, that these defenders are looking in completely the wrong place. So the other thing we know is that with experts, they look at less things for longer. So there's a player who's noticed this. So and is actually trying to support these players over here. But sometimes we need to help the players understand where to look. So something I would do a lot is like in attack, like what's if you could only look at three things, what would you look for? And they might say space on the outside. Are we going to penetrate them through the middle or the backfield? And, of course, they would need to have calls for those things. It might be like how deep they are, who's at first receiver, where have nine and ten looked, I tend to ask a lot of experts what they look for, and then I have a better understanding of what to look for and what to coach it. Um, um, so, so they're all, and, and of course, they're all looking at the ball. And of course, no one can give feedback to this player. And Steve Borthwick is like refereeing, and he's kind of focused on this, but but everyone else gets seduced by the game. So. Um, I was when I was at Sale the other day, they divided up their coaching responsibilities. And Alex Anderson, five minutes in, said, Actually, I'm really struggling just to focus on one thing as a coach that isn't the ball. So if we put this on again, and actually I ask everyone to not look at the ball now and actually look at people off the ball and what they're doing and what their movements are, and um, there'll be a bit of movement stuff and, and just see like it's actually quite hard to not look at the ball. Like Virtually put your hand up when you've looked at the ball because um, you will have probably looked at it by now, would be my guess. Is anyone claiming not to have looked at it yet? But it is hard. Um, my view is if there's two coaches, really to have more than one coach, or five coaches, to have more than one coach looking at the ball is not that optimal. Um, there are other things that we could be looking at, like where are people looking? What are people doing off the ball? Um, yeah, that's going to be more helpful. I don't know if anyone has any questions around that, but again, like, actually, I'll give you one more. So here's a really good, this is for me. So I've done a bit of work with New Zealand for the Olympics, and this is like, like they did a whole project around co-coaching. So Tomasi and Clark. Scrum, you can have a scrum there if you want. You want a scrum? So, and just Clarky must have known I was talking about him. He just texted me. The, um, so that's taken a bit of work because think about this. And again, like power dynamics are critical in coaching. So Tomasi is Fijian. He's pretty quiet. 
he wouldn't speak that often. Clark, he's Scottish. He's quite uh, outspoken. So for Tomasi to do that takes planning. Like, this is what I, you know, this is how you can help me, Tomasi. Like, when we're doing the session, if you notice anything that we can do to change, to make it better, come and tell me I'm all in. These are the times when we'll we'll get together and we'll talk about it. So that is like, a, well, how long is that interaction? 30 second interaction where they talk about changing the practice to help support the players. Um, again, I'm, maybe people are doing this. I don't think it's that common um, that people are that intentional around co-coaching. And if I give you a, just before, okay, you, ask, you, just before you ask me a question, um, there's loads of options in there. So we did a bit of work with Ulster and they talked about, here's some different options. And so put this on that they're kind of coach CBD or a Bath Academy. They actually like, look, this is, this is how we're going to do it. And these are the functions of the different coaches. So, um, Eamon, it sounds like you're going to ask me, it looks like you're going to ask me a question. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. empty at the moment. I'm just enjoying it. <laughs> um, is it because they're using the drone footage afterwards? Yeah, I mean, again, even if you just like put a GoPro on, I would put GoPro on players, like because then they don't behave that differently. Um, but you'll just get some good kind of feedback on your interactions. Again, maybe put the GoPro on the player that you think you speak to the least, um, as an example, and just actually see whether that's the case or not. So if we go back to this, like the reality of coaching off the ball is if you're all looking at the same thing, you can't coach off the ball. Um, and I have some quite strong views on like what this should look like in attack. Like I think there should be a first receiver each side. And I think inside support is really high value for, for a fly half. Uh, lots of clubs don't use it. The clubs that are near the top of the prem and in other competitions, they use it. Damien McKenzie likes it. Um, Barrett likes it, Mark Smith likes it, and I think this is a high value position here. So, being a flat player on the edges, high position, high value. Um, I prefer uh, back in front of forwards, but I know that lots of people are happy to 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 give the ball to the players that aren't as skillful as the other players. But that's just, I guess, my view of the world. Um, so, this then probably leads into so once we, once we get into like. It then leads into this, and so, like, how you coach. And this, for me, is the magic. So if we've got clarity on really good practices, being aware of myself and what I do and what I say and who I speak to and what I miss and what my empty chair is, and when I'm working with someone else, like that clarity, then I think we can get into this. But imagine this if, like... If you haven't agreed that, then we just end up with, so for example, we end up with like two coaches both speaking to one player 12 times and saying different things and not speaking to another player. Or we end up with, and again, just ask the players, I ask them all the time, do you, do, you, do the coaches sometimes confuse you? Yeah, all the time. They actually contradict themselves. I asked my son the other day, he told me his rugby coach contradicts himself all the time. So it can be quite confusing some of that stuff so but but what i think is like when we look at off the ball next week like here's some examples of stuff that i think will happen um i would use freeze a lot freeze stay where you are defense you have to stay where you are attack you got five seconds to get into better positions so england would have benefited from that got five yeah, seconds can to i get just in. say something yeah yeah um, I, I feel a big part of it is, I mean, I've listened to a lot of your phrases and terminology there with, with the groups of 13s or 14s or 15s is, you know, inside support, first receiver. A lot of them don't have a clue what you're saying and, and you're going through it and you understand this and you get a oh, flat ball or a deep ball. And, you know, there's 15 kids looking at you and as you as a coach, you know, you're just moving on through what we need to do. And I know, I know even playing a game at the weekend with 16s, that there were certain guys didn't understand when I was saying seal and, you know, seal the ball. And a lot of it is the terminology that we use that they just don't have a clue what we're saying. Yeah, yeah true. Story. I mean, uh, of course, I'm using my terminology now for you, but I'll use that. I know. I'll use their terminology. So I'll ask them, like, do you, have a, do you have a name for this? Or what about this? Or do you have an analogy for this? 
So I would use an, I would try and use their analogies a lot. I think analogies are like coaching gold. So, <clears throat> and I work with lots of, so to give you an example, and it's a really good point here. And like, so I, I work with an, an international rugby coach, an international hockey coach, both of whom videoed themselves and spoke. They probably gave the, the players about four or five like technical points. And I said, oh, do you have an analogy for that? And they said, yeah, we do. But, but, but I want to give them detail. So I'm probably like speaking in my language and it's a great shout out from you, Ian. I will use their language. Okay. So I will 100% want to use their language next week. Now I might not get it right all the time, but I'm definitely not going to use words that they don't understand. Uh, and if they don't understand, I'll, I'll definitely check whether they do or they don't. Yeah. And of yeah. course, what I will also do is, because one of my coaching ticks is, does that make sense? Then I'll, I, I, w- I won't say that. I'll say like, which part of that do you least understand? Or I'll say like, who's got a, who's got a really good question? Because um, often, you know, it, it'll be interesting with, you know, boys and girls, the boys will tend to nod and, and comply. And then as you say, like, they didn't understand it. Like, yeah. However, the girls won't let me get off the hook in my experience. Um, <clears throat> so it's a, it's a good point. Um, and of course, like for me, it fits into the like analogies Like we need to use <clears throat> their language. So as an example, so the other week I coached and I would talk about a replay Cool. do you want to replay that rook again? Do you want to have another go? Do you, you know, let's go back to where we were and let's replay it. And a kid said, Rusty, can we call it a flashback? like we call it what whatever you want to call it like and of course then it's their language and they start to go flashback rusty can we have a flashback and of course like the question i said earlier here and about like asking the players or do you have a call for that so i'll say what three things would you look for an attack they'll say edge penetrate through the middle space in the backfield and they'll and i'll say oh do you have a call for that and they'll kind of look at me all and i'll say cool well we've got Shout out what you would call three, two, one. I get about 10 different answers. At which point the coach, so any coaches of the kids next week, get it in early, will say, but we told them that. However, it's our language. And I see that in the Prem. So when Marcus was finding it hard at Quinn's, he said, Rusty, we got 16 calls for kicks. I'm having to translate something into the name of an animal to then shout that animal to someone else who then has to translate it. And it's not our words. Um, so, Ian, if you're there next week, you definitely need to pick me up if I'm doing this because it's critical, like, using their language. Sure. That, um, that, that probably, Rusty, like, are we, sometimes in coaching, are we guilty of coding too much? And I, I was on a coaching course recently and I was looking at a module on the Rook um, and this was... AIL and, and some ex-professional players and there was about three different codes for the the first and second entry player in a rook and, and the first and then second entry player is probably decided by their position as opposed to the code word you put on them. Um, yeah. Again, I was with uh, Hockey Wales the other day and I heard one of the coaches talk about transition and then I heard another coach like talk about it but it sounded different. So I was like, okay, three coaches like I just want you to like write down what transition is and like give me it on a piece of paper. And they all have three different answers. So again, it's not even just me, Ian. If I'm working with another coach and we don't have shared language. So I happen to think Newcastle Falcons is the best academy in the country. Like if I could send my son to any academy, it would be Newcastle Falcons. One of the things they do really early on is get all their coaches in and go, let's agree our language. So they would talk about creativity, but they would all know that creativity means solutions to problems. So they would have absolute clarity. Now, what I've now noticed is that their players are better than problem solvers because, as you said, Ian, they speak the same language as the coaches, and it's just they don't have those three or four different words. They know what one word means. Um, So also consider yourselves as coaches, like, how clear are you that you're using the same language? Um, yeah. Anyway, so it's, it's it's a great point. So I guess with the off the ball stuff, I think the stuff I would use a lot is like freeze. I would definitely go close your eyes. Like 
how many attackers are outside you, how many defenders. If there's an overlap, and I know they haven't seen it, but of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at where they're looking. Um, I might scaffold that. I might go, like, close your eyes, like, put your left hand up if you think the, the fullback's in the left of the backfield, right hand, both hands if you haven't looked, and I might point them towards something to look at. But, of course, I can never make the assumption they've seen what I've seen, so I need to use that quite a bit to start with. And I might just start quizzing players around what have you noticed and, you know, how many, where's the best space and just starting to, um, I think best space is useful language. Now, again, the kids might choose to change that, but there is space all over a rugby pitch, 7,000 square metres and space everywhere. But where the best space is, is probably something to consider. Um, Co-coaching is critical in off the ball. So we actually need to have some people whose function it is to, to maybe think about like what they're looking at and where they're standing, because clearly where you stand influences what you see. Second ball, I would use quite a bit. So actually ignore that ball, let's use this one, especially with the younger ones around when people get into good space, because I want to reward that. So actually we've noticed some good space over here, Rusty. Actually ignore that ball, we're going to use this one. And again, you could use scoring systems. So when I coached yesterday, I worked out that the kids on the end were seeing the space, but they didn't know what to say. So we agreed a word. We agreed banana, random. I just said, pick a word. They said banana. And it was it was one point for a try, but five points if you called banana and you got it there. So if, like, you spotted the space collectively and then you – and, of course, the other thing we could do in terms of, like, off the ball to help build connections is to is to question, but to maybe ask questions of other people. So I might ask you, Ian, like, what do you think Eamon's thinking? Or what, what do you think Eamon's seen? So I might ask more questions. If I want to build combinations between players and accelerate them, I'm probably asking someone about someone else. Um, and I guess this is just like a page with some coaching skills I'm sure people are using that, that I might use quite a bit. Um, the other one that I can't remember if I said it on this call earlier, but like I've been doing a lot is like that. If you want to come out and hang with the coach and we'll watch some stuff off the ball and you can then go and give some feedback or you can go back into the game. So I'm, I'm giving people more chance to think slow and come and like see some stuff with me as a coach. The other reality, Ian, of all of this is like if you are like Steve Borthwick, you're refereeing, you're keeping score, then it's really hard to do anything else. So I worked with a worked with a football coach and I said, Well, we're gonna like me and you are gonna look at off the ball for 15 minutes and we're gonna see if we think of the best three scanners. And he said, Well, actually, Rusty, I can't do that whilst feeding the ball. So think about what you might be doing as a coach that'll be getting in the way of you doing might be where you're standing it might be what you're doing i want to give over scoring and refereeing as soon as possible i think they're important skills i think they build empathy and understanding of the game and fairness and i get that with teenage boys it's harder but i don't think you have time not to be be, be doing that quite frankly in the same way that i don't think you have time not to be able to be able to turn to the kids and go, you've got 30 seconds to get into four fair teams. And they they should be able to do that. Of course, that's like going to take a little bit of work, but I don't think you have time not to do that. Um, and then I guess the stuff that kind of sits after all of this is like is like the individual interactions and like, yeah, what, what do they look like? And that's the magic for me. And so hopefully, like, that'll be the, the cool stuff next week will be the, the, the individuals. I'm going to stop sharing because I'm mindful. I feel like I've spoken loads. And Eamon, if anyone has any questions, I haven't seen the chat. Great question, Jason. Give you a shout out, Ian. Top work for the shout out. Rusty, can, can I just ask a question? It might even just be, it's probably more out to the wider group as well, but... See, if, do you ever come across coaches that obviously you present that to them or even there might be people in this call thinking, 
there's a barrier or I'd, I'd say a perceived barrier to me implementing this approach to coaching? Uh, do I come across them all the time? Um, and of course, like pre-morteming a session is really important. So um, like if I'm coaching 13, 14, 15 year old boys, well, I know some stuff's going to happen. There'll be times when they don't listen. There'll be times when they play up in front of their mates and they think it's cool. There might be times when someone's mean to someone else. So when it happens, I'm, I'm really chilled about it. And it'll be exactly the same next week. So like some people might not want to listen and the door isn't open. And of course, I'm going to feed the hungry. That's the reality. I guess in my current role, because people tend to come to me, like the door's already a little bit open. And sometimes people take a bit longer. So a hockey coach I've been working with has taken probably two years, but he's now gone really extreme. He's gone like more extreme than me. And it's like completely blown my mind. I don't think this is extreme, by the way. I think this is like really good learning principles, like contextual. It needs to be contextual. You need to individualize stuff. Like you need to find the appropriate level for people. You know, the right amount of scaffold, the right amount of support. You need to get people to think and to grow their awareness, like in order to be effective at the game. And I guess what I'm talking about is accelerating it as opposed to when like happened with lots of people of of my era, like there was a nine and a 10 who were pretty good at problems. So, I mean, maybe just imagine your teams, take out the nine and the 10, how comfortable would they be? Like, that's the that's the reality, isn't it? When Johnny Sexton didn't play for for Ireland, they weren't as good. Um, yeah, and and I also think we need to help. Again, I'm going to go back to it, but at 1718, when someone makes a decision, they're going to structure kids and tell them where to stand in a one three two two or whatever it might be. Then we need to have given them all the skills to be able to survive. So 5022 comes in. All the coaches will now be going, why can't why can't the centres kick? Because actually the centres spend less time kicking than 9, 10 in the back three, who spend loads of time kicking. Um, and I guess, so the other thing, the other way I think about coaching is this, and Fraser is like, I'm just talking about options here. Like, till I meet the kids, I don't know, do I? So I coached a session the other day, and as I checked in, went to give two teenage girls a fist bump, they refused and walked off. Um, I was like, oh, my God, like, this is going to be a good challenge for me. And, of course, their mood influences the rest of the group. Like, they are the two most dominant characters in the group, and they're and they're pretty grumpy. So, like, I have to spend some time on that. And, of course, that isn't in my lesson plan at all. So I have to deal with that. So, so, so to go back to your question, like, it's just about options, isn't it? And then... Then, as a coach, we make decisions. So we see stuff, we notice. It's the we can't notice stuff. So, like I saw a girl, the the conversation about the self harm came from me seeing a girl who wasn't the coach's daughter. And there's like thirty people in this session. I was like, I'm like mesmerized by that girl. Like, there's some stuff I need to know. Like, I'm looking at her and I can see she's got issues at home. She self harms. It's girls like her that are the reason I got involved in coaching. Wow. But of course, I need to see that for us to have that conversation. I don't notice that we never have that conversation. So I think it's it's noticing you then have options and then you choose. So like, what's your first choice? What's your second choice? So if someone does a, so I did feedback with Ulster. So um, I spoke to players that have, progressed through and played for Ireland, played for Ulster and some players that are no longer in the academy. I did a two and a half hour interview with them, which we then played back to teachers and academy coaches. It was, inc- inc- it was incredible, like the feedback they had. But number one from all of them was, why do we do an opposed so much? So, of course, people might, you know, they could defend it, but, but of course you're not scanning for anything, are you? And if we've already... Well, I, I know scanning is the most important skill. And if you're playing against no one, you pro- you're actually like de-skilling yourself on scanning. But of course, like, so my question is like, so what's your second choice? So when you go unopposed, what was your second choice? Was it to have one defender or two? Or was it just to do what you've always done? Like, if you can like share with me when you're doing something, 
my second and third choice were this, Rusty, and I didn't do them because of this, then, then you're thinking critically as a coach. If you're just doing it because you've always done it, then, you know, if we're just doing an opposed pass, so when you do an opposed passing, what's your second choice? Is it one defender? Is it two defenders? Was it they start on their chests? Was it different start points? Whatever it was. And I guess, like, like I'm just trying to build more options so that I can, like, help people as much as possible, both, I guess, predominantly players, but also coaches. Um, so a really good game to coach off the ball. So yesterday I did a session with their under nines and it was just to play life of the ball. So, you know, the, the minute the ball stops moving, it dies and the other team get it. So suddenly everyone off the ball is really engaged. Uh, how do I get them to share the ball? Uh, we played a game where the try was worth however many passes. If a new player scored it, the points were doubled. So again, we get people sharing. The other thing I did was I had the two most skilled. They said, oh, our kids don't share the ball. So I said, okay, cool. Who are your two most skillful players? Lads, lads, I've got a secret mission for you. Do you fancy doing it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first of you to make 50 passes in the games can pick a coach to sing a song. Are you up for it? Oh, my God. We can pick any coach. You can pick any coach. So I've got the two best players passing the ball as much as they can. Like, job done. Like, it's sorted. And then we've got a scoring system that encourages. So, like, practice design and an interaction. But, of course, I can pre-mortem that. I know that there's going to be some kids that are more skillful than others. And often they don't want to pass it to other people. But the other thing I have in my back pocket is if I referee the game or if I run the game, I can introduce a second ball. So that beforehand, I chat to the coaches, tell me your four players that will touch the ball the least. Every time I introduced a second ball, I gave it to one of those four players. They get loads of touches. And again, I can think about how I give it to them. So come towards me, come towards me, Fraser. Give you the ball running. It's different to I might throw it over the head of one of the more skillful players or I might roll it at his feet so he knocks it on. Then I have a choice, don't I? Like, I can give him a replay, or I can let him stew on it, because actually I think he's a skillful player, and I want him to, to, to stew on it a little bit. And then I might give him another, do you want another go later? So it's a great question. I think I'm just trying to create options so I can make better decisions as a coach. And I go back to the start. I started like everyone else. I thought about the practice design, not that much, if I'm honest. However, because I know I love them, I played lots of games and I coached people on the ball and I didn't coach off the ball enough. And that was when I started coaching, it was back in the day where we all copied wasps, didn't we? We just went around the corner as the forwards, which was, a, which was an advance from all eight of us going in the ruck. And then at some point you'll get into like a system, I guess, and you'll – you know, because the, we haven't upskilled the forwards enough, we have to tell them where to stand. Imagine that, that they don't know enough times tables, that we have to tell them where to stand. And some of those forwards are going to get really annoyed because actually they are skillful and they're being limited by coaches. And so we'll, we'll, we'll pick any series of numbers that, that adds up to eight. So we'll go one, three, two, two, or one, three, three, one, and people will copy. And, and, and of course, like, what was your second choice? So when you did one three three one, what was your second choice? And why did you choose not to do it? Or did you not even think about it and you just copied what the All Blacks are doing at the moment? Um, and I'm not stupid. I also understand that if you're going to win a game of rugby and you've got some players that aren't skillful, you might have to tell them where to stand if your job's on the line. But if your job isn't on the line, I think I'm always thinking, how can I make this player more skillful, more adaptable and... Yes, you know, that's that's like the stuff I would get excited about. And, of course, they're more likely to stay in the game if they're more skillful. Because those kids that were really big at the young age that were running through everyone, well, they're all dropping out in England because they're getting frustrated because they can't do the stuff that everyone else can do. Um, and I will be quite playful with the lads. So I'll be able to work out straight away next Tuesday. I think it'll take me five minutes to work out who's left-handed. Um there won't be many. Uh, everyone will struggle. Everyone else will struggle off their left. Well, there's a high chance they will. And the other thing is, they won't even look right if they can't pass off their left. So again, we have 
we need to give them all their times tables. So pretty common for me to be coaching and there to be several kids racing to get effective non-dominant hand passes. Because if we don't encourage them to do it, they're never going to do it. And they'll drop out later. Must be, I'm conscious of the, the the time there as well. So we'll 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 take another few questions. If there if there's any questions there, feel free to throw them in the the chat or, or um, open up your mic if you wish. Um, just one one from me, Rusty. Um, I suppose we we spoke a lot about communicating with players. Um, I suppose if coaches are reviewing a session themselves. So again, in co coaching, there's two or three or four coaches together. What questions should they be asking each other? after a session in order to really challenge and progress each other from week to week? Um, and actually, I've got a really good question from Aidan that I'm going to mention in a second. Um, I mean, I guess it depends what your intent is, isn't it? So if you haven't shared something beforehand, so my view should be in the session plan, there should be a, this is what the coaches are working on. So I work with England and, like their session plan includes what size ball they're using, but doesn't include what the coaches are working on, which blows my mind. Like the biggest way to have impact both in school and on the pitch is to have better coaches. So we need to be, and of course we have a choice. We could share that information if we feel comfortable and there's a trusting relationship, we could share that information with the players. And I think if you get to that stage, then you're going to get better pretty quickly because they will give you feedback. Like, and I would be pretty keen. I would share with them. Um, so my coaching buzzword is nice. I say nice. It comes from a really nice place, but it's not that helpful. It's like confetti. And, and actually I've shared that with a group and then I got really good feedback at the end because they all like had a guess on how many times I'd say it. They kept count and someone won a bobble hat. That is awesome feedback. I will say nice less than I used to. So I think it depends upon their intent. If I'm working on, my feedback and asking permission, then I'll share that with the other coaches. Now, if I'm working on interacting with the kids that need the most support, which would be a good stretch for me, then I'll share that feedback. If I'm, if I'm working with like working on my individual interactions, I might actually just stop the session halfway through and go, put your hand up if you feel like you've had a meaningful individual interaction with me. And I'll get feedback straight away, won't I? Like, if it's like three hands and I think it's 10, then I can start to like go, okay, well, what was it about my interaction that wasn't that helpful? Um, I would ask people a lot, again, go back to that, like, I'll ask the players a lot. If you could share one thing with me that'll help me coach you better, what would it be? And they'll give me unbelievable answers that will really, really help me. So a girl last week said, Rusty, um, lots of people give me feedback individually, but I want it in front of the group because I want my friends to know that I'm working on stuff, which was like fascinating, isn't it? Um, I think it just depends what your intention is. I would involve players in the feedback process. Like I think it's like optimal, but of course you've probably got to direct their attention towards something to have good feedback. So if you haven't told them in advance, we're working on this, then they won't pay attention to it and they probably won't notice it. Um, Aidan asked a good question, actually. So he's put, you said uh, they're about scanning. So have you an example of good space as opposed to bad space? And if there isn't good space, how do you create space? So great point. And I think it depends upon the team you're coaching, but you could definitely freeze and go like, you could, you could rate space, couldn't you? You could go, where's one, two, three for us, given our skill set? And often people talk about like missed opportunities in rugby, but they don't grade the opportunity. Like, was it a gold, silver, bronze? In the same way as not all passes are the same. So if I pass and fix two defenders, it's a higher value pass than if I pass and fix no one. In the same way that not all rooks are the same. I would actually grade rooks. Like if you put one player in and they put two in, it's a plus one rook. Um, but of course, like we're, we just measure rooks. Um, so the stuff about fixing, I think is like really interesting. My view again is that, and I work with, I've just been on a Zoom with some coaches in France. 
Every time they run a loop, they create a line break. Every time. I think loops are a really good way of fixing mass would be the, the like putting defenders together. However, what do all their players want to run? Out the back. They get caught out the back loads. But it, like, so I think loops and switches are like underrated. I think inside support. So ways to, to fix players to then create space elsewhere. And again, like as we showed in that rondo, I think I would score fixing defenders. So I think it's like, it's really high value in the game. So if I can run a switch or a dummy switch with Fraser, we hold two defenders and then I make a pass, like we should be like celebrating that and scoring it. Um, and if I don't, if we run a dummy switch like five yards away from the defensive line and someone gets banged, then we should probably talk about how we can fix defenders. Um, I guess it'll probably look like better in, in, in person, some of this stuff. Um, like, but I actually think players struggle to understand how to fix defenders these days. Like we see loads of really good opportunities and people either just travel across the pitch or, you know, they run out the back shape because I don't know, rugby league's taken over our world. My favorite uh, movement actually, and I did a podcast with Joe Schmidt the other day and, and I spoke about it on it is like, is the um, uh, Johnny Sexton 10 to 12, 12 as an inside option, put a ball player at 12 who can like, can throw a miss pass, can kick, can like, I think it's almost undefendable, but like, it'll come back around in fashion. It'll be like, uh, it'll be like cords. It'll come back or a lumberjack jacket. Maybe consider again, how much time do you spend speaking with your players about like, and, and someone again, uh, Ian, great question, but someone said this to me the other day, Rusty, could we use the word entertain defenders? I was like, we can definitely use that word and I'm definitely stealing it. Like, I love the thought of entertaining them. Like, what are we going to do to entertain the defense? Um, and, the, and the reality is like with our systems -y stuff, we're often, so sorry, I, I'm going to show this because I think this brings it to life. This probably explains what I'm trying to say more than anything else. I should have shown this slide. Um, this for me is the downside of system. So I don't know if hopefully people can see it. This is Bath against Extra a few years ago. Everyone's looking at the ball. These guys are putting their hands up because they don't want to take responsibility and have to make a decision. And lo and behold, they're like low numbers. All the defenders are looking here. No one, you know, close your eyes, lads. Where's the best space? No one has a clue. Um, and this is the downside of structure, like to the extreme. People start organizing themselves this way, like let's call it east to west, instead of understanding like some of this stuff. There's, I think there's 28 players in this picture. Um, to me, that's mind blowing. And, and I think the coaches think that the structure means they're going to be more spread out, but sometimes like these fellas don't want to get in the wrong position. And yeah, so just be mindful of, again, like people, it's like the same with calls in defense. Like, so I had a good conversation with a lad at Gloucester and he said, oh, he said, Rusty, we call 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 from the rook. And I said, what does 40 do? And he said, uh, stands between 30 and 50. I'm like, mate, you're going to get good at maths. Um, and of course, you're looking left and right instead of looking in front of you. Of course, you need to look left and right as well. I'm not stupid, but your, your first instinct should actually be see the problem in front of you and then work out how you're going to defend it. Um, 